Hello, this is Dr. Mewborn, and this is Christology. We're in Lesson 28, and we're looking at Evidences of the Resurrection. So good to be with you today. Let's go ahead and jump into our study. We saw this slide last time. It reads, If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 17. Very impactful verse here because it's speaking of how important our faith is, but really, even beyond that, how important it is what we put our faith into. An old saying that I heard several years ago was, your faith is only as strong as the object you put your faith in. And so it's important for us to understand that if our faith is in something that collapses and does not work, such as if Christ had not been raised from the dead, then we really wouldn't have a faith worth believing, or we wouldn't really have a system worth believing in or a relationship with Christ. And so it's very important to understand this text in its entirety, that 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is really what we call sometimes the resurrection chapter. And this chapter helps us to understand that if Christ had not done what he said he would do, there would be no faith, no true faith that we could have. It would be pointless, void, worthless. So that's important as we look into this, um, this presentation today. All right, well, let's look first at the proof or proof that Jesus rose from the dead. After the resurrection, we see that the tomb was empty, John 20, verses 1 through 18. Jesus had scars on his hands, feet, and side. Jesus ate fish. We see that with him on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, Jesus presented himself to over 500 people, 1 Corinthians 15. And then Jesus ascended into heaven in Acts chapter 1, verse 9. This is important because um, as Jesus shows himself to all these different people, um, to over 500 people during these 40 days, on probably, I, I think the count is around 17 different appearances, it's important that these people are seeing um, the Messiah in, in his true self with the scars in his hands and, of course, his side and his feet. And so this is proof that Jesus did raise from the dead. Now, there's an acronym for the resurrection that I think is very helpful for us, and it's the acronym from a, for the word ALIVE. The A stands for Acts of the Apostles, L, Lives Transformed, I, Illogical Fabrications, V, Verified by Witnesses, and then E, The Empty Tomb. This is very helpful when you're trying to uh, share the different truthfulness or the different proofs that the resurrection truly occurred. And so the first thing we'll look at is the Acts of the Apostles. Um, there's a total change in emphasis in the way people lived and the way people, and the way people acted. And I'm talking about the disciples, the people that knew Christ, believed in him, and then after the resurrection, how their lives changed. Well, number one, the Sabbath worship changed from Saturday to Sunday. This was an important thing. Now, this took a while, a few years to do, but it was important to see how there was a change taking place because um, Jesus rose on a, on a Sunday, which being the first day of the week, and so worship was changed to the first day of the week. The Holy Spirit filled believers starting at the day of Pentecost. This is a complete different thing for the um, the worshipers of Christ because on the day of Pentecost given to us in Acts chapter 2 the Holy Spirit comes upon them and when it comes upon them they begin to speak in different tongues and they understand each other and what's happening in that passage is God is showing through evidence that the Spirit of God the Spirit of Christ has now entered into the children of God and now they all have this amazing bond which a truly is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, there was always evidence throughout the book of Acts. You see this, that when somebody came to know Christ, there was evidence of it. And then you see this transfer over to the Gentiles. When they came to know Christ, the Holy Spirit would um, manifest itself in them. They would do something that would show evidence that they also had received the Holy Spirit, and they were children of God. And then as you read the book of Acts, you don't see it as you get further into it because you've already seen the transition from the um, 
from the of the Holy Spirit coming into the Jews than into the Gentiles, and and God is just showing them truly through the Book of Acts that they are children of God filled with the Holy Spirit, and so that's what was happening at the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit re releases uh, its his when the Holy Spirit releases power upon them and they're able to do these things. And then thirdly, the Passover became more ceremonial than literal. After all, Jesus was and is the Passover lamb who takes away the sin of the world. And so what changes during this time is a, a, a changeover from the Passover being ceremonial, um, almost something that they did just to celebrate a deliverance in the past and, and of course, celebrate all that God did. Now it was changing over to becoming a literal understanding of what Christ has done and what Christ has fulfilled. And so the feasts in the Old Testament now were being fulfilled in the New Testament of all that Christ was accomplishing and he was doing this through his incredible work, um, uh, through the, being the Passover lamb. Amazing, amazing connection with the Old Testament. The next letter is L, Lives Transformed. During the crucifixion and burial of Christ, many of the disciples deserted him for fear of their lives. When then a few weeks, the apostles were empowered and emboldened to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. That's huge. What changed? How were they able to now, who the people who were once afraid to even come around Christ, even Peter denied Jesus three times, why now are they so empowered? Well, this is what the Bible says. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, it says, but, and this is the time when Jesus has already raised from the dead. He's in his resurrected body on the earth. He's about to send, ascend to heaven to, be, to sit at the right hand of God. But this is what is said. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. He's saying there that the, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be strengthened and emboldened uh, to go and take the gospel forth. Their lives are transformed because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which brought forth his work through the resurrected state, then he would ascend to be with the Father, which led into the Holy Spirit going forth because he told them, when I go away, I will send the Holy Spirit. Um, and these people were changed. Their lives were changed so much so that, like in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, the Apostle Paul said this, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Hey, living is, is, is good, but even dying is better and, and that just shows a changed life because he has been impacted by the resurrected Christ. The apostles counted all joy when they suffered for Christ. So no matter what, they were willing to take beatings, imprisonment, do whatever. Their lives were transformed because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The next thing is illogical fabrications. Um, and, and this is an interesting part of the acronym, which I think is a wonderful one, um, the disciples' testimonies. Now, some good questions here is, number one, could a lie transform them into the strong apostles that they were? If they knew it was a lie, or if, if they were just aware of that, or if they were creating it, would they really, really die for that? Could a lie transform them the way that they were transformed? Well, I would say not. What was their motivation then if, if it was a lie? So that, that's, these fabrications are not right. That's been, that's been said by many people that the disciples were lying. And that's, they were creating a story, fabricating things. And if that's the case, then why are they willing to die for it and be beaten for it time after time? Who would die for a lie? And the idea there is if somebody knows that something is a lie, um, very, very, very few people in the world would ever die for that um, because they know it's not correct. It's wrong. And uh, it's just kind of an odd thing. Um, the next thing is the reliability of early historians. The New Testament is the most accurate, literal, and preserved collection of writings in history. So, 
the word of God is speaking truth. It is not fabricated. It's not created. It's not just something that can, people came up with as fictional stories. It is literal and it is the most trustworthy book on the planet. It's the most trustworthy book of all time. The lack of contradictions to the New Testament is proof of its historicity, its accuracy, all those types of things. Um, and so, listen, these, when we think, when I think of these men being transformed, I think of a butterfly, and, and you can even use Romans chapter 12 for this, because it talks about being transformed in, into the likeness of the Lord, um, and do not be conformed to this world any longer, be transformed. And so the idea is the Greek word metamorphosis, and so the greatest picture of, of metamorphosis is the idea of the caterpillar going into the cocoon, coming out as a butterfly. And that's the idea that happens with the um, with the disciples. It's like they were um, a caterpillar when Christ was on the earth. Then when he died, they covered themselves. They almost hid away. They scattered. And then when Christ rose from the dead, you start to see uh, this new creature emerge. And then as this new creature is emerging, the next thing happens, the Holy Spirit comes upon them and they just take off and they go and do the work of Christ. It's an amazing um, example. Now, something else is interesting about the illogical fabrications is that they don't add up. The Jews were looking for a Messiah that would save them from the Roman oppression. Yet Jesus came as a servant who was crucified. The disciples were looking for somebody that would save them from Roman oppression, but that's not what Jesus came to do. So that would be, that's an odd fabrication that they would create. Uh, women were the first witnesses of the resurrection. If the disciples wanted to create a hoax for the resurrected Jesus, why would they use women who at that time were often looked down upon or their testimony was not as strong um, as, as a man's at the time? So why would, if this was a fabricated story, why would they use women or they take their testimony as being the first foremost testimony. Then also, the disciples had trouble believing the women's testimony that Jesus had risen from the dead. Why would they include this in the resurrection story unless it was true? So it was true. You, They're not creating a story. They're not creating a lie. They're not doing any of those kinds of things. They're saying this is what happened. And they're falling in line with all of that because they saw it. They know it. And it wasn't just some kind of created thing. The V stands were verified by witnesses. The women at the tomb, Luke 24, uh, the apostle Peter was a witness in Luke 24, 34, 1 Corinthians 15, 5. The disciples in Luke 24, more than 500 brothers at the same time in 1 Corinthians 15. James, the brother of Jesus, 1 Corinthians 15. And Paul on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9, he, that's where Jesus approaches him. And, and uh, it's just incredible. So we see a guy here on the right. He is um, taking the stand to be maybe an expert witness or something like that. These people were expert witnesses. They were there and they know what the Jewish customs were. They know what, uh, what it meant to raise from the dead or what it meant to come back to life after they saw that crucifixion. They were the experts and they speak of this. All right. And the E stands for empty tomb. Now, there's theories concerning the resurrection, and I want to lay those out because it's important to talk about what these theories are. Number one, the swoon theory. Number two, wrong tomb theory. Number three, hallucination theory. Number four, stolen body theory. And then the ultimate one that we will talk about is Christianity, is that it's the true not just theory, it's fact that Christ rose from the dead. Now let's talk about the swoon theory. Claims that Jesus did not die, he simply fainted from blood loss and exhaustion. The Romans confirmed that Jesus was dead. See, this is the interesting thing. Now, if, how could it be that? That's the claim, but what we're doing now is looking at the rebuttal to that. The Romans confirmed that Jesus was dead. They were experts in death. They confirmed that he was dead. The stone was too heavy for Jesus to move by himself anyways if he was just completely exhausted and beat up and um, 
half dead anyways was when he was on the cross and when he gave up his spirit but all those types of things and he had a, a course the spear went through his side the roman soldiers lives were at stake and so they would have made sure that he was dead because that was their job and then a half dead jesus had not had no chance of surviving three days in a tomb that is just ridiculous the next theory is the hallucination theory this idea of somebody seeing something through these lenses that's very different than what you're really seeing claims that Jesus died and the disciples hallucinated his resurrection. How could over 500 people from different situations hallucinate the same thing? That is just ridiculous. And this would have been a 40-day hallucination. Think about that for a moment. It would have been a 40-day hallucination, which is just bizarre because he, the Bible accounts for him um, coming to speak to people 17 different times or up to 17 different times, maybe even more than that. But that's how long this hallucination went on. That doesn't make any sense. So this theory, of course, is wrong as well. The wrong tomb theory um, this has a lot to do with the women that went to the tomb. Claims that the women went to the wrong tomb. Well, the weird thing about that is the women had been there 72 hours earlier. So they wouldn't know where it's at. The women were looking for a sealed tomb. The man at the tomb said Jesus had risen. The tomb was a private tomb. Joseph of Arimathea would have clarified any problems that they had. So this doesn't make any sense. There, why would there be a wrong tomb theory? So that doesn't make any sense. And then the, um, the other one I want to share with you is the stolen body theory. It's that the disciples stole the body, claims that the disciples stole the crucified body of Jesus. The Roman soldiers were executed if they were caught sleeping while guarding the tomb. So this is not going to happen. In the case that the soldiers were sleeping, they would have awakened when the stone was being moved. Because after all, it was a massive stone. If the disciples did steal the body, why did they fabricate a story that they were willing to die for? That doesn't make any sense either, does it? Now, here's part of this fabricated story. Matthew 28, verse 11 through 15. While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priest all that had taken place. It's talking about resurrection of Jesus. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell people. His disciples came by night, stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, he, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Now, this is what they were trying to do is trying to trying to sell a lie, get a lie out there, write the narrative as we use that language a lot of times, tell the narrative. But that's not what was happening at all. It was a complete hoax. Now let me share with you what's going on. Five theories about the resurrection. Number one, Jesus died, Jesus rose. That is Christianity. That's proof in the pudding, as they say. The next one is Jesus died, but Jesus didn't rise. And here are these three. The apostles were deceived. Hallucination, the apostles were myth makers. There's myth, they're creating these things, these lies. Uh, the apostles were deceivers. There's conspiracy that they're coming up with, all those types of things. And then there's another uh, theory, which is Jesus didn't die. And this is what we call is the swoon theory. But what is so great is we know that Jesus Christ died, rose again, of course, declaring he is the Christ of Christianity. We come back to this. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Christ rose, conquering sin and death, and has said this, that for all who confess that Jesus is Lord and believe in their heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. All right. Well, this has been Lesson 28. Good to be with you as we looked at evidences of the resurrection. God bless you and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.